My name is Amy, known as California Princess, born and raised in Pomona, California, and this is my story. I was a single mom of three, and I obviously have half siblings through my dad's side. Growing up, well, she worked a lot, and we had a few more, mainly with, with my grandma, which that's who pretty much raised us. And then that house, that's how I met my husband. He was my neighbor. We went to the secondary together, but he was like a year younger than me. And then, well, yeah, but my good memories there were just. I was a tomboy, so I would play like football with them. I would ride bikes, do the skateboard thing, like everything. And then I would babysit him. And then as we got older, when then I, they would make me walk him to school, like we had to walk together. And as we got older, um, he became my boyfriend. And then from there, like I think we went to seventh, eighth grade when he went to juvenile hall. When, and he, his mom's a single mom too, so we were neighbors, so my, my grandma would help her as well. She had seven boys, but five at the time. She was pregnant with twins. And they were, the older ones were in and out of juvenile hall. So when we got to seventh grade, he ended up going to juvenile hall as well. And then from there, well, we were badass fuck. <laughs> oh, we submission. And then he came out of no, yeah, he came out of juvenile hall. We I went to regular school, and he ended up attending like the probation school, and he was just not doing anything good, you know. Her oldest was really bad too. She he was in camp, so that's when he she decided to move to Arizona because the oldest was coming out. But my husband, he's the third oldest. He didn't want to leave. He didn't listen. But like growing up together, obviously my family knew him, so they took him in because he didn't want to leave. He was like running away, so they took him in. After that, he ended up uh, having to leave because uh, the probation officer said something about if he had to go with his mom. He ended up leaving. I ended up dropping out of school, and I ended up running away to Arizona, and that's when I got pregnant for my first baby. And from there, we moved to Kansas. And that's when we ended up, we both ended up in juvenile hall. Me for running away and him for talking shit to a cop and stealing his gun. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I think we're going to let him go, obviously, because we were minors. But since I was a runaway and obviously my mom was looking for me, even though she was upset with his mom, I was already pregnant, but nobody knew. So once I got to jail, went to the juvenile hall, that's when kind of everybody found out. And then they wouldn't release him until I came back to California. So then they brought me back. And then from there, I was able to talk to my mom, go back. Because my mom, again, she was a single mom. Uh, my oldest sister had already had a baby and pregnant with her second one. So that was like a lot for her, you know? And yeah, I was able to go back. And then from there, yeah, we, we stood there and then he didn't, he didn't learn. So he was being bad in his, the way his mom kind of like raised us was, she, my mom was more like the strict mom. So his mom was like more like the party mom, you know, but she was still mom, you know, like he wasn't listening, like he was in drugs. He was being bad, you know, and we had our baby and I was so young and I was like, I would follow him. She was all right, you want to go with him? Like, I'm going to teach you guys a lesson. So she kicked us out. And then from there, we ended up in the streets. And we finally came back out here. And then my family, well, they helped us out, obviously, because we were so young. But he just changed his whole life around. He started working. I think when we graduated high school together with both our boys. Um, um, <clears throat> it's a hard topic to talk about. Where was that? We graduated high school with our boys, and then from there, well, he started working. And then, well, once we turned 18, we got, I do not want to finish school. Because I was, we, when we came back, he was kind of going through it, like, because we were always, we kind of like left my, well, I left my mom at 14. 
So even though when his mom lived out here, well, he had his house. Like, you know, he would be back and forth. It's not, nothing like having your mom, like, states away. So he was, like, uh, sad. Like, you could tell. But he would, like, suck it up. But um, I didn't want to finish school. Because we lived on the east side of Pomona at the time. And our school for a continuation was all the way by, shoot, I want to say north. So it's like a big, like to travel, you know, at the time we would take the bus. So by the time we graduated, or no, when I was, we were almost done with school, I was about, or not I don't know, I was just like almost eight months pregnant. He would wake me up like, we're going to be late, we're going to miss the bus. I fuck that. I wanna. I just wanna go to sleep. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of walking. But my mom, you know, she always tried, and then everybody would help us out. But we were very prideful, you know. Like we were like, oh, we have kids that are young ones. We're gonna do it ourselves. Why? Because we watched these two ladies, you know, like fucking struggle to raise all of us, you know. So we're like, no, we're not gonna like. We could do it ourselves. So we'll take the bus and we'll travel all the way over there. And then we almost quit school because. Well, in Pomona, on the on the east side, it's like more bad, like more like Pomona, well, not bad, but a little ghetto. <laughs> and then we, he almost got jumped, and I was about to give birth. And that's when he's like, you know what? Like I'm just gonna go to school by myself. You're gonna stay home. Like it's just getting like too crazy, you know. And then from there, well, we ended up finishing school, and then we got our own place, and we he got a job. We would work. We started working at a Chevron where my aunt used to do a uh, manager. And that's where he met his boss. And he started like uh, doing electrician. And from there, yeah, he just went to school. He got his license up to when he passed away. But like he did, he had, he left us pretty set, you know? But I have four kids with him. I have 16, 14, eight, and five. I forgot. <laughs> She's five. Be like before he passed. Obviously, I work as I wanted to. You know, he worked hard enough where I didn't have to work anymore. You know, my kids. Uh, it, there's there was a point when they were about like I want to say six or seven. My younger brother got into some stuff. They raided my house, and he had to go to jail because he was the on the lease. My husband. And it, was, it took him a lot, a lot to change, you know, like to do good. And then for well, my, bro, my younger brother, for me taking him in, you know, kind of fucked it up for him. And he had to go to jail for like a year. It's not much, but it took time away from my kids, you know. And he, would, he wouldn't forgive him like, when he got out. Because he ended up going to prison, too. Um, but... Should I forget where I was going to tell you? You were talking about, uh, so pretty much we don't know how your husband passed. Oh, yeah. Oh, from there. So before that, I think he passed away like a couple years later, like two years later. But from, the, from that point, like that's where like when it came to the kids, they were young. But they, they, like, again, like you guys, we never really sugarcoat anything. Like, But we let them know at their knowledge, you know, at their age level where they can understand, you know. Like I couldn't lie to him and say... Oh, he's at work far away for all this many times. You know, my kids are fucking over you. They'll be like, well, why is he only calling, you know? Why you got to press a button to answer my dad? <laughs> um, so I, he didn't want me to take him to the jail, but I ended up taking them. And we just said, like, he kind of explained, and I told him, like, we just got to let them know because if we hide it from them, they're at that age where, like, oh, you're lying to me, you know? And I don't want them to lie to me when they need to come to me. We were on the same page. So that was one, that was hard. And then he came home, and then that's when we moved to that apartment where he passed away around the corner. Um, a couple months before that, my son's appendix had erupted. And it, when it erupted, I guess he got like an infection and he had gone like gangrene or something. Like it was a bad infection that was getting to his blood. So I remember, uh, he, he was very, like, strong, you know, like, like I'm a crybaby. I'm the one, like, oh, my God, like, just already, like, crying. I haven't, the doctor hasn't even said anything, and I'm already crying. <laughs> but he was just, like, he'll sit there, and, like, he, he'll, like, I'll stay here, you know, we were switching off. He was going to school, school finishing his schooling, 
and then work and then same I was going to school and then for med medical assistant at the time he was finishing his license for his journeyman and then um yeah they had told us you know they were they he had three major surgeries within a, less than a month and they just told us like you know like we cannot operate on him anymore. there's only so much that we can operate him or like put him down on um what is it like the local anesthesia or anesthesia is this your husband no my son okay. so my that's where my husband that's where we started kind of like it was kind of weird because again he was upset with my brother like you know like little stuff that kind of like like I didn't notice, but after he passed, uh, he was very like, oh, I, the, if I die, like, like he, this is how I want to be buried, you know. So when my my son was like, they told us pretty much like we can make him as comfortable as he if we can, you know. They were giving him like uh, strong medication, but he was in so much pain. Like they kept washing out his intestines and stuff, and my husband's like, I can't do this. Like I've never seen him like. So like upset, like he's just like there's so much death here. Like I just I want to leave. <clears throat> and then one day, like <clears throat> we were able to take him home. He hit like um <clears throat> his fever like went down his infection levels, and the doctor told us, all the people in my husband were, before they told us, he was just like, fuck, you know, all the good shit that I've done in life, like our other God taking me from my son. And that's when the doctor came in and told us, like, he's doing a lot better, like, you guys can take him home. You know, like, we don't have to operate him, he's just gonna have to be on medication for a while. So we were happy. And that day when we took him home, it was May 18, 20, 2019. We were on our way home and he was just like super happy and blessed. And then he was just, uh, he just kept telling me like, you know, if I die, if I die tomorrow, like uh, you're my wife, you know, like you decided for me. You, um, Uh, he didn't want to get buried. He just said, just, you know, cremate me and bring me back home to my kids. At the end of the day, that's who we stay with. So the next day, <clears throat> he went to work and he got out early because he was going to get a tattoo. And then that's where he meet up with my brother. And then he just pretty much called, like, everybody, called his mom. Like, he was reaching out to everybody. He was just so happy that day. And we had, it was a Friday. It was like the long weekend, I think it was. I was, um, I got home and I, he had just ate and he wanted to go eat again, which down the street was like the Buffalo Wings. And he wanted to take my brother and he wanted to go on his bike. So I told him, all right, you know, like, well, okay, well, it was just like the guys. So I told him, I'll just stay with the kids. You know, my cousin was there. And, um, what's it called? I was still sitting in the garage when he left. And he, um, passed away, like, right around the corner, five minutes later. But I, I, I heard the, I heard the, like, the loud crash. Like, it sounded like, um, like a trailer, you know? I didn't think nothing of it. And then, oh, uh, when I was walking towards the front, that's when my mother-in-law calls me. And I just, I'll never forget her voice. Like, she sounded like she was running, like, like running, like, like if she was running for a long time. And she just kind of like, she took a deep breath and she was like, oh, you know, where's, his name was Joel. So she's like, where's Joel? And I was like, oh, he went out to eat. And then she took another breath and then she was like, uh, with like, your brother just called me that he crashed. And I was like, no, he was on the bike. He goes, <clears throat> Well, I don't know because Mike was crying and <clears throat> he's saying that he passed away. So I hung up on her and I'm calling, I called my brother-in-law and I've never heard that fool cry. I've never heard him cry at all, like at all. And when I...
when he picked up the phone, all he did was he was crying. And that's when I met my husband was not here. So then I got in my car. I told uh, my neighbor to watch my kids because my kids were upstairs. <clears throat> I got in the car and I just remember turning the corner and everything was already blocked off. And as I'm walking, like, I see my brother and then I see like his whole bike just shattered on the floor. So I like, I was still like hoping like, because there was another another guy with them in a bike. So I was like, nah, like there is, it can't be true, you know? like. We had parties to go to. We had a whole like, weekend plan. And then uh, when I arrived, I, uh, I already knew like there was too many ambulances. There was in like, uh, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know where he was. So then that's when I got closer and they were just, uh, they were telling me that I couldn't get any closer because they were still trying to get him out of under the, the truck that he got stuck in. And then I was just like, I was just there waiting. And I just remember telling the cop, like, <clears throat> where are you guys taking him to, you know? But when me and my husband were in high school, we uh, did our classes at the emergency room. So we would hear a lot of the EMT guys, like, they're talking about their codes and stuff like that, the lights, like what they would say. So as I'm, I'm sitting there, like, that came back to me. And the guys, the EMT guy is sitting there on the gurney and he's just waiting, like, like calm. So I knew, like, I forgot what they said. And I just knew, like, oh, he's, he's not here. Like, he's, that's it. And they were doing the lights of jaws on him, like, where they were trying to cut the car because he got stuck under a towel. And then um, they were finally taking him out and that's when they started flashing my face. So I already knew, like, oh, you know, he, he doesn't look good, you know? And yeah, that's when they told me, like, yeah. Like, I kept asking the cop, though, like, you know, can you please tell me where you're taking my husband? He's like, I don't know. And then he's like, can you come and just tell me your information? And I was like, I don't give a fuck, like, to give you shit. Like, I just want to know where you're taking him. And then he just kind of stood quiet, and he just told me, like, he, he didn't make it. Like, now you have to get behind the yellow uh, tape. Like, he was a dick about it. And then... I just remember like a lot of families showing up, friends. And then I just, uh, I was there till they took him. And then from there, like everything just changed. And, like my whole life changed 360. I wasn't the same mom, you know? I became very like uh, emotionally detached, like with them, like <clears throat> not like I didn't love them. I just wouldn't let them hug me. It felt real, almost. And then from there, like we cremated him, we brought him home, and then I just had to pick. Like I kept waiting for him. Like, I, I just, I wasn't all, like, I felt like I wasn't all there. It was kind of hard. And then from one day, I just kind of, like, I was like, fuck, I got to figure out what I'm going to do. Like, I wasn't working uh, uh, for kids, you know? Like, fuck, I can't, I can't do it. But, like, I didn't know where to, what, how to do it. And uh, I ended up um, moving back with my mom. But I became very, like, kind of, like, closed off to everybody. And then finally, when I decided to, like, oh, let me give people that I didn't talk to a second chance, which one of them was my dad. And that's where I am, where I am now. That situation. But I don't know what to say. Yeah. For the kids. Um, what helped you get out of that? And just snap back out of it. Well, snap out of it and continue being a mother after all that. Because I think it's very important for like yeah actually going through that. Well, yeah. That now that's exactly like I I talk about a lot about like what I went through. 
because I know a lot of friends and family, the coworkers, like people I don't know, and they just kind of ask me, and I kind of share my my story. You know, like one day, like I was so like I never, I was I wasn't a drinker, I didn't use drugs, you know, like I was just so out of it, like I just felt so lost, like in myself, like I think um, at like before we cremated him. I just kind of like, I kicked everybody out. People that came like from different states and stuff. They were staying there, like they were just kind of like, just there making sure like, oh, she's gonna do something to herself. But I was just kind of like out of it. And then I just kind of would tell, I told them one day like, you guys gotta get the fuck out of my house. I gotta clean, I gotta cook. You know, my husband's gonna come home. But every day I would do that until it hit two o'clock. I was like, fuck, he's not coming home. And I did that for a while. And then um, I got to a point where I didn't let nobody inside my house and I wouldn't let my kids out because I was just scared that, dang, what about they're walking in? Then they're gone. <clears throat> so one day I just, I felt like I was like, a, uh, like by myself but not by myself, if that makes any sense. Like, I know I had like family there that wanted to be there but I just wasn't allowing them to come near the, near me. Like, I, I just, I don't know how to say it. Like, it didn't make sense, you know? Like, they were trying to help out, but I just wouldn't let them help me. So, one day I just, I felt really like, 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 oh, like that's it. Like, God, you're gonna take me, like, take me with my kids, you know? So, I think I, um, it was me and my kids. It got to a point where we couldn't sleep in the rooms anymore. Like, I couldn't sleep in my room because obviously it's a room where I shared with my husband. So we started sleeping in the living room. And then one day I just kind of like, I don't know what I was thinking, to be honest. I wasn't. I closed everything, turned on the stove, we went to sleep. But my neighbors downstairs, which is a small world, um, ended up being my brother's best friend's dad and aunt and uncle, which they all helped out like when my husband passed away, like for a mess and all that. But they were very, like, they would always keep an eye on me. They were, the, everybody around me was, like, older. So they would always, like, oh, you need any help for anything? But I was, like, no, you know? And so I turned on the stove. We went to sleep. And then I had, like, a, a nightmare. Like, my husband was in there. And I woke up. And I'm, like, oh, shit, what the fuck am I doing, you know? Like, that's selfish of me. Selfish to do that to my kids. So I opened everything. And then they usually go, like, they come out. And they sit up because they had, like, little plants. And they used to live upstairs, and they used to live below me. So when I opened everything, they could smell the gas, you know? And I'm trying to get the kids up, and they go back, they go, they come upstairs, and they're like, it smells a lot like gas. And I was like, I think the stove is leaking. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to tell them, but the lady was like, she's just looking at me, and like, her husband's like, okay, I'm going to come and check it out in the morning, but we're downstairs. So they're like, how about you let us take the kids? And I told, <clears throat> I told them, yeah, like, yeah, so it's like the smell, you know, could go away. And then she kind of just sat there. And then she just, <clears throat> she just sat there. She didn't say much. She didn't say nothing, to be honest. She just, she just sat there. I wouldn't cry. I wouldn't, I was just sitting there. And it helped me out a lot. He would do it a lot, like, after that. Because <clears throat> she knew, like, the stove isn't fucking leaking, you know? Like, she just told me, like, I'm going to stay here with you. And then just process everything. <clears throat> so I did, and then I just kind of, that's when I called um, both grandma, which is my mom and his mom. And I told them this. I just told them, like, I need help. Can I help the answer? They did for a little bit. They helped out. 
And then from there, I just kind of like, um, I just kind of like, I, every time I would feel like that, like, I would talk to my kids, talk to my mom, like what everybody, and like, I took therapy too, but I ended up getting a fight with her. like not in like a verbal fight. <laughs> I, I hate therapists. <laughs> Like, how do you know what I'm feeling? You don't know. Like, you just read a book. <laughs> she was like, no, I know Miss Garcia. <laughs> I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> she was cool, though. Like, she helped me out. But it was just, to me, like, I don't know. I guess how we're raised. It's like, how the fuck is somebody going to tell me what, how you're, like, how am I supposed to feel? But she was right, though. And I don't, you don't stop grieving. Like, she's talking about stages and stuff like that. Now I'm able to talk about it with my kids because my oldest goes through, like, He's going through depression. And I could tell, like, there's times he has, like, really sad moments and really angry moments. Like, like, and I'm able to help him out, you know, like, I tell him we're all going to go through it. And it's just going to get, it doesn't get any easier at times it does. And sometimes it's going to be harder. But I feel like I'm helping him out, you know. And then just as a mom, you know, I tell him all the time, like, I'm learning as, as, as you're growing every day, like, you guys, fucking, I'm a mom, like, two, four, well, five now, but it's different with each kid, different age, you know, like, my second oldest, he's, a uh, he, he doesn't really cry, he's, like, how he said, life goes on, what do you want me to do, I can't cry about it, you know, like, I can't sit and dwell on it, like, I love him, but that's it, you know, like, he's like that. And the other one's more like, he, he took it really hard. Like, he, to this day. I think that is my biggest fear as a mom. For like, like a suicide is so real, you know? So I always tell him like, like if you ever need, like if you don't even want to talk, just tell me. Because after I got, like, like I started, like, you know, with life, doing stuff with them, you know, like, I noticed that he just one day he just told me, like, I have no purpose. Like, I don't have that. Like, I don't have purpose. Like, I don't, don't want to be here. I think that broke me because around that time, my little cousin had just committed suicide. And he was part of my son's life too, so it was just like one after another, you know? And uh, I just told him like, don't, don't ever do that. Like ever, like, you know, like, life is so precious regardless of the hard stuff we go through. And I was like, you just gotta keep pushing every day, like just make it the best that you can. Like it's not, it's not easy, but be, feel blessed, you know? Like life, even in the struggles, and I tell him and I share with my kids, like, shoot, there was times that we, me and your dad were sleeping in the car and we would laugh about it now, you know? It's just like the, the beautiful struggle of life, you know? Like, there's so many people that would want to be here and they're not. Like, so I tell him, don't, like, I, it's okay. Like, I tell him, like, because he's a very, like, um, I'm not supposed to cry. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Like, like um, I don't know, like, I don't know how to say it. He's very boyish, I guess. He's just very closed off. So I tell him, nah, yeah, you are. Like, it took me a long time. I tell him, but yes, you are. You have that right to to uh, process every feeling that you're feeling, you know? Like, everything, like, just process it and then, like, feel it. Like, the more you ignore it, the more you, like, become bitter, I guess you can say. Because that shit, the depression and the loss of somebody makes you bitter. Like, that shit made me bitter for a long time. Like, I was just mean, bitter. I wouldn't let my kids hug me. I'll tell them I love you, but from, I, I love you too, but not a hug, not a handshake. Like, for my husband's, because uh, we did a cremation um, ceremony, I didn't let nobody shake my hand. And it wasn't for me to be rude, but it just made it feel so real, you know? Like, okay, he's really gone, like, what? Like, you know? I think up to the point where... Cause after we brought him home, um, we had another like a what is it, a rosario, 
And after we brought him home, I think my aunt said, like, are you okay? And I think that's where I kind of like, yeah, I'm fucking me. Because how someone does they look like I'm fucking okay? Like, what kind, of, what kind of question is that, you know? But I was just like out of it. They got to a point where they wanted to take me to the hospital too because they were scared. And I was like, I'm not going to do shit, you know? Like, you're stupid. Like, I lost my husband. I'm not fucking crazy. The, it does. It, I was like, my, I just felt lost, you know? But eventually everybody like kind of, they stepped away. But little by little, they they come around. But yeah, it, it definitely does change a lot. Like I, I'm very open to talk about my depression with a lot of people. Like I still kind of go through it, but I, I talk myself out of it. Especially in the situation I'm in now, it's like, so I, I wait because in this situation, like when we went to see my husband when he was in jail, obviously like, they had mom and dad, and like he was coming home. And then when I had to go to jail, my kids, it was like the hugest disappointment, you know? Like, cause they're older and it's like, my my oldest was like, how am I gonna get you out of this one, you know? Like, cause he always was the one to like, when I'm crying or like I'm going through something, he'll pick me up, give me a hug, like, mom, don't trip, I got you. We're gonna figure it out. You always do, mom. Not tell me I do. They all, that was his, that's his thing. You'll figure it out. We'll be good. And I was like, yeah, you're right. In my head, it's like, fuck, I'm not going to figure it out. <laughs> but yeah, when they went to see me, I was like, fuck. Like, I could see, like, tell my dad's not here. Like, what am I supposed to do? But I always tell him, like, I, like I'm always going to come home, regardless of what. Like, I'll, I'll make it back home to you guys. Sure enough, like, in jail, like, I wasn't close to God, like, at all. And when my husband passed away, I think I just, I even got baptized, but I just felt like it was like, where were you when I needed you? You took somebody from me. You're supposed to be so good, you know? But it's just like lessons in life, you know, like they make you stronger. So when I got to jail, and then, well, my brother too, like, cause he had to be the one to be there when he passed away. I hated him. Like I hated him. Like I couldn't see the side of him. And he ended up catching a murder case. And I just remember my mom told me, like, your biggest poison is your mouth, you know? Like, watch what you say because Dios castiga. That's what she would say. And I told, I remember I told her, like, that's what he gets. That's what he deserves, you know? Like, he's, he's going to rot in there because you shouldn't take nobody's life. He didn't. But, you know, it's part of whatever the hell he's going through. But... I was like, um, I was just being so mean and saying like some fucked up shit to my mom. And she, she just told me like, you're a mom too, you know, you're not perfect. Like you, you wouldn't like to be in my shoes and I would never wish that upon you. But our kids, as much as I try to, you know, teach you guys, right, you guys got into your own mess, you know? So yeah, like she was right. But I mean, I hated the fuck out of that food. <laughs> I wouldn't even, I told him I wouldn't even give that food $10 to eat in there. Like that's how mean I was, you know? And when I went to the county, and it took me like about a month, and then I was like, fuck, I couldn't get him off my mind, you know? And it's because of the way they treat you, and they're like, fuck, like worse than dogs. <laughs> and I was just like, I don't know, I just started going to the, like, there's this lady, she would, she, um, she would just talk to me like all the time, and then she was like, well, what is it in your heart that's so heavy, you know? Like, I could tell, like, in your eyes. Besides everything that was going around me, like, like I just, I don't know, very positive because little by little with my depression and overcoming a lot of little, like, stuff on the, besides where I was at, like, I just was positive, you know, but I, he was heavy on my mind, like, I hadn't talked to him, I hadn't known nothing about him, and then I just picked up the phone, I called my mom, and I told her, like, I'm sorry, you know, like. I wouldn't wish this upon anybody. And everybody deserves a second chance. And I just kind of told her, like, I for I forgive him because it's not his fault. But I think I hold it I hold it against him because the previous year that he took from him. And I just like and he had to be there, like, and then the shit that he would say because he was a drunk before he went in, he was a drunk, he would fucking pop pills, so he would talk out of his ass. So when we would argue, 
he'll like say stupid stuff without him notice, like knowing what he was saying or like bringing up somebody that's no longer here is I took it to the heart, you know, like uh, it just I mean feel some type of way. And um like I was just some like, you know what, I, I forgive I forgive him, but I forgive myself for hating him too, you know? Like I don't want to carry that in my heart. Like that shit's like a burden, you know. And I was and I told my mom, forgive me for talking to you like that because I do have kids and like look at me now. And she just told me like You'll make it back home. Trust me. Sure enough, a week later, they told me I had bond and I was home. <laughs> I freaking walked my ass to the AMC and got me a Red Bull. Because, <laughs> yeah, coffee was a motherfucker in there. I got hooked on that. <laughs> but, yeah, not, um, yeah, I think my biggest fear was to, like, I was able to come out. And then I just seen everything different. Even, like, being more positive as I was um, before I went to jail. I tried to see, but then I was still very, like, kind of negative, you know? And um, once I came out of jail, I just kind of sat there and I told my kids, like, you know, I'm sorry. Like, like sorry for, like, anything I've done, you know? I'm learning as I go and just forgive me. Like, I love you guys and just every day is a better day, you know? And, yeah, like, from that day forward, like, I've just been, um, I talked to a lot of, like, younger kids, too, about depression because I think that's, like, the biggest thing right now that to me is very important is like suicide depression like I have a friend like well she's actually I'm not gonna say her name because she's actually like the person that signed for my damn bond like she just had like a breakdown you know and she she's going through through that depression and I tell her like I don't know what's going on it could be the smallest thing it could be to me it could be small and to you it could be hard it could be for like the smallest thing and some people take their lives, you know? And I was like, if you want to talk or if you just want me to sit there, you know, I'm there, you know? Like, just whenever you think about doing anything to yourself, like, you, you're you just valuable, you know? Like, yeah, there's people that love you. And yeah, that's what I've been doing. I have coworkers too, like, out of nowhere, like, they're like, oh, you know, like, I feel so depressed, you know? Like, and they're young. So I, I like to share my experience a lot with people. But, um, and then I've been working, doing photo shoots, doing, like, here and there, a little, uh, what is it, collab with certain brands, like this one. This one was a dope one, too. <laughs> like, he was a shit talker. Like, he was a shit talker, period. So, a lot of, a lot of the times, like, we, we kind of sit there and we talk about all the stuff that he would say. And then how he was a paparazzi and stuff like that. So... When I did get to recover that phone, the lady's son had the phone. And I remember my brother-in-law was like, fuck that fool. Like, you know, like he, he, cause I would sit there every day, like every single day. Like, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Montclair. So where Kingsley is at, Kingsley is a busy street. So Kingsley and Helena is like right before Ramon. It's all like passing. So I lived on Kingsley and Ramona. And then Helena is like one of the little streets. So that street, like it's, busy so that's where he got hit and he got stuck and there was a few people within the five years past that have passed away because people go fucking fast and they just they don't care you know and um when he passed there was a, a, a little bit like of a kind of like a, like a fight because I, I remember the cops being there a lot you know it was it's very gang active so um when he when he passed, uh, the day that he passed, one of the girls came out. He he was on a bike, so he was going pretty fast. But then he got like they hit him, so that's how he got stuck. I was able to watch the whole survey because the house across the street and the house that where he hit, where well, his bike hit, had surveillance, and I was able to sit there and watch everything, how he got hit, how he passed, and everything. What I didn't know was that his legs got cut off. That's what I seen the AMT guy carrying to the ambulance. But other than that, like, yeah, like the girl came out and she was like kind of like talking shit. Like, and he, they were st he was still in the bottom of the car. So my brother freaking socked her out, you know, like, and the, but the cop was very like, um, like shut the fuck up, you know, like go, go over there. Like, you don't say shit like that. Like one of the cops. And, um, yeah, she was just, like, saying, like, that's what the fuck he gets because he was going fast. 
And my brother fucking just launched at her, like started stalking her out. And then, you know, guys came out and he used to do tattoos. So a lot of, he did tattoos from a lot of people, like a lot of different hoods and everything, you know, cause he was like, he wasn't in no games, but he was on a, a bitch, you know, but he just said, look, I'm a tattoo. You want me to tattoo you? Anybody welcome to my house. You can take that shit outside, you know, like I'm cool with everybody. And it showed, like, it really did show because when he passed it, that night, like, there was people that I hadn't seen, like, since we went in elementary and they were there. Like, I don't even remember. Like, there was a lot of people. But for, for his kid of mess, um, yeah, I was passing out the flyers and I wanted that fucking phone. And what well, people saw, like, we were knocking on doors, giving the flyers out because it's, like, a small lot of, like, apartment complex. Um... Ends up being the freaking, the the lady's son. And my brother-in-law wanted to, like, I don't want to pay him. And I was like, bitch, just pay him. Like, I don't give a fuck about the money. I want the phone. I got it fixed. And I got over 3,000 pictures, videos of my husband with my kids. Like, uh, my youngest daughter doesn't have memories of him. Because she was only seven months when he passed. But my other one, like, oh, that girl, she was spoiled, you know? Um, but they, they get to, I get to share that with my youngest ones. And as, as we go, like, sometimes I get my oldest son, like, hey, mom, can you send me some videos? Because I forgot how he sounds like. And it, it is, I tell him, it's not that you forgot. It's just, like, you grieve so hard, you kind of don't want to remember at times, you know? Like, I, I get that, too. But, yeah, like, that, I don't, I don't know, it just, it makes me happy. Like, I was not, like, open to pictures. And now that I look at it, I was like, fuck, where was I? I remember I was there. Because <laughs> my kids tell me, where were you? And I was like, I just didn't like taking pictures, you know? But that's what pushed me. Like, I remember when I, they first hit me up, like, oh, can you model my car? And I say, yeah, sure. Like, even though I'm, like, very shy and I was all red, like, my makeup was like, I was like this. <laughs> um, all I could think of is, like, fuck yeah, he loves taking pictures, so I'm going to take pictures, too. And that's where it kind of, like, that picture led to more and more. And then, yeah, there I am. The whole IG and stuff. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's cool. When I started, like, going about life, you know, and then I ended up meeting my baby dad. I can say his name either. But I ended up meeting him, and then the worst mistake. But a beautiful blessing came out of it. I ended up uh, getting pregnant, and... I had my baby or whatever, and then when I got myself, oh, when we, around the time I got pregnant, he disappeared. Like, he just kind of, like, he didn't want it, you know? He was doing his own thing, so that's when my dad started talking to me. Like, I don't know, I don't, I can't really remember how he got my number, but we started talking. Whole point, like, just, first it started like, oh, you know, can you do me a favor? Oh, my wife's going to come through. Like, can you pick her up? Sure. Like, sure, you know? That's when my other brother comes in. And then he gave him some stuff, and he ended up holding. He ended up dying. And he, um, it was a year that he passed away. He OD'd off, um, fentanyl. And... <clears throat> And we buried him, and then from there, I had my baby, and then that's when my baby's dad took him from me. I went to take one of my cousins. Uh, it, I was just supposed to drop her off. She was getting cosmetic surgery. So, I was, so she got cosmetic surgery. She got, like, an infection. But here they won't treat you. And, like, I was the only one that was home. I was breastfeeding, but I ended up pumping out milk, and I told my comadre, like, can you watch them real quick while I just drop her off and come back? Within that process, well, obviously I went to eat. I posted it on social media, and this was he's it. By the time I'm heading back, he's already at my comadre's door with the cops. And because we don't have, like, a, like any agreement, like, the cops made him take, like, they gave him the baby. Because she couldn't keep him. And he was only three weeks old, and he was a preemie. Uh, oh, because he was we were supposed to start going to court for so I wanted to uh, do like 50 50 like you know but 
a little oh, a little bit before that I would I, when I when I had him he ended up showing up but I had already had him he showed up like an hour I think an hour later we I get I allowed him to sign the birth certificate and everything so when he took them that's how he took him um I, I started I would do visits since he was so little and he's a preemie I told him I'll take him but he can't like I can't get you let you stay with the baby you know but I'm there all day if you want like when you get out of work or whatever one day he was drinking and then we were kind of arguing and he I, he decides to kind of like lock himself in his room with the baby while he's sleeping but I'm like hell no you know he's drunk like but my baby's little like I'm not gonna let you stay in the room with him so he fin- I put my hand, he finally opens the door, and I get my baby, and this one starts to push me, and that's when the baby gets hit on the head. So I take him to the hospital. From there, that's how it started. We, um, we, I put a, what is it? Restraining order. Not a restraining I didn't want to put him in jail. I just wanted to go to a court just to have it more, like, written, like, okay, these are your days, these are my days. This is where we meet up, we meet up. You know, just so we could have it on paper. I just, I didn't want to do the whole, I felt like I was going out of my way so he could be a dad, you know. But thanks to that, when he did take him, he wasn't seeing him anymore. So when he did take him, um, those fucking people did not, they gave me the runaround, like, for a long time, like, two weeks. I slept in my car trying to get these sheriffs to give me my son back. Till finally one, one last one. It was a young, a young cop too, and he went in there. I told him like, "Well, what do I do? You know, I'm not leaving the city till I take my baby with me." And then that's when he's all like, "Well, I could do a welfare check." <clears throat> he went in, and he comes out, and because the girl, the girl cop is being a bitch. Like she's being a bitch. She's just like, "Well, I'm gonna arrest you." Like she was already just profiling. You know, she's being a bitch, and then well, I was like, "Well, I'm a mom. If you have kids, you know, like I'm not gonna leave my baby." Like. And the the cop comes out and he's like, all right, I understand why you don't you want to leave. Like, he was little. Like, he was, like, really five pounds. Like, he was tiny. And he's like, I mean, the baby's okay. Like, I can't take him from him physically. But I understand why are you wanting to take, you know, he should be with mom. And um, that's where he told me, like, you need to go to the San Bernardino County. Like, I had showed him that I had already went to file, like, a while back. So he told me how to do it. Like, get an emergency hearing and get an emergency restraining order because you do have that. He hit you. So, even though you're not pressing charges, but that will help you out to get your son back. So, yeah, I, I did that. And then finally, I, when I got the restraining order, I took my ass back to Lancaster. And again, the sheriffs didn't do nothing. They gave me, like, they told me there's 48 calls. Like, um, whenever we get around to it, we'll call him. And I was like, what the heck? Like, how could you guys leave a little baby? Like, you know? But I was like, whatever. Okay, so. Comes to the morning, and that's when the, the sheriff tells me, like, oh, well, it's not valid here. That the restrainer wasn't valid. That they couldn't. Oh, because we couldn't serve him. It was me and my sister. So we decided to go to the courthouse. Yeah, we went to the courthouse, and he had, to, like, I'm like, oh, well, we'll just pay a, a sheriff, you know? Because we were just trying to serve him. So when me and him, when I got, everything was cool. I mean, we had our ups and downs, you know. It was just a mistake of a fucking relationship, you know. But we both learned, I guess, you know. Like, um, when I ended up getting pregnant, that's where he kind of, like, I found out a little too, like, I was like, about be three months. You know, it caught me off guard because I was on birth control. And then that's when I was like, oh, shit, you know. I wasn't glued. I was like, why am I throwing up? I'm not glued no more. <laughs> I went to check myself. And then, yeah, they told me I was pregnant. It happens. So they made sure they run like labs and all that. Make sure, like, you know, you're good. Well, um, he was upset. He didn't want it. And I told him, fuck, it's too late now. But, like, and I told him, like, cool, you know, you don't got to be a part of it. Like, I make my own choice. Like, I'm raising four by myself. One more, one more. You know, like, I can do it by myself. He was all in his head, you know, like he stood away and then he'll come here and there and it was, it was getting ugly towards the end. Like he was just being a dick now. Like now he's like, well, since you're keeping it, like he was constantly threatening me, like, I'm going to take him from you. I'm going to take him from you. Like, you know, like stuff like that. And then when I had him, I still told him like, well, I'm about to give, I got COVID. I got COVID and I was, 
35 weeks, 32, yeah, 35. And uh, uh, they kept me there, and then COVID made me give birth early. But I told them, like, hey, you know, I'm at the hospital. I was there for fucking two days. No, no, nobody, well, they couldn't, nobody could show up, only if dad wanted to. So I didn't allow my mom to come or my, my close cousin or my sisters because I wanted to make sure, like, if I did go in, like, into labor, like, he would be able to be there because only one person could go in. And, yeah, he never showed up. I told him, and he freaking showed up an hour later, like, all mad. You had him without me? And the nurse turned around, like, she was here for two days without medication because I didn't, I didn't get to get no medicine or nothing. She was like, so she did a good job. And he kind of just, like, looked at me like, what is that? <laughs> but, yeah, not after that. And then that's when, when, when he took him. Well, when the whole fight happened, like, him hitting or whatever, like, he was just, like, oh, like just being a dick, you know, like, saying all this shit, like, being mean. And so I, that's why I stood away. Like, I went to court, and I decided to do all that. But, I mean, I was in IT there. It was both ways. Like, we just kept, like, cats and dogs. So, so up to when... um. This last time I went to jail, he showed up again with the cops and took the baby because he stopped again seeing him. But because we couldn't get along. So, and then, then he bring the baby mom or like say a lot of stupid shit to her too. Like, like I, don't, I don't know her like that, but you know, it's like a lot of stuff. And when it's your kid, it's like you're not his mom or like, you know. So it was like a lot of back and forth. And then finally, like, when I went to jail, that's when I tell you, like, uh, even my hate for that but went away. Like, I just, I don't care, you know. At the end of the day, I see, like, I just want to raise this baby and, like, for him to have two happy homes. But he was more like, well, I'm giving him that family image. You're just a single mom with your kids. And, like, little stuff like that, like, to, to like, kind of, like, antagonize me. Like, All right, so, like, I'm going to fuck you up, you know. I'm going to run you over one day, you know, I'm not. Um... But, yeah, he would be like, he would say stuff like that. And eventually, like, uh, we were, we'd meet up at the San Fernando Valley Police Station. And um, we exchanged them at first. No words, no nothing. Literally just the baby and go, you know, like, not even, we wouldn't even try to touch same hands or nothing. Because there was just that much drama with us. But eventually I told them, like, um, I think it was for the, to baptize our baby. We said I'm baptized, but I told him, like, well, you should tell your baby mom, you know? Who else? I mean, she's, he's already growing up. Like, you know, he comes back and forth. He sees her, like, like my baby's happy. He's a happy baby. So I tell him, at the end of the day, like, I, I don't care, like, what or our past or how we get along. Like, I, I give it to her, you know? Like, I'll shake her hand, like, that's what's up, you know? Like, she's, that's a woman, you know? Like, she's raising some, like, in her side and loving him like her own. Like, what mom wouldn't want that? You know, I don't want her to dislike him because of me. So, yeah, like, yeah, that, like, he kind of got that. He, like, he's just, he's cool, you know? Like, he's just all right. We had CPS involved, too. That uh, was drama with that. So you guys are able to co-parent now? Yeah, now we're okay to co-parent. Before, it was co-parenting, but it was, like, strictly, like, I couldn't see my son till the day I got him. Like, that's how much... He was being like that fucked up, you know? Like, oh no, I don't want to send no pictures. You can't call my phone. You can't text me. I'm not going to let you know anything about this baby until you're visited. But the judge switched that up really quick. Like, he really thought that I wasn't going to get no type of, like, like only visits. And the judge's like, no, she gets her 50, you get your 50. He's like, you don't come into my court. Like, that's how he was. He was very, he was very lenient. It goes both ways. And because I told them, like, oh, yeah, he's a good dad. He's just a shitty man. But he's a good dad, you know, like, as a dad, he's a good dad. But now, like, like we got all over everything. And, yeah, the co-parenting is better. Like, now he'll FaceTime me. We talk about, like, like doctor's appointments and all that. Like, all that. He's a real happy baby. What would be the, the words to your previous self who was in that situation? If you could go back and talk to yourself, what would you say? make better choices because it's not only like strangers or friends you know sometimes like family like they give you the worst advice but you're your better judgment like use your better judgment your intuition you know like no I shouldn't you know like 
yeah, yeah, use your intuition for sure. Like, don't just think about it three to four times if it's really worth it. Especially if you have little ones, you know, like, because ain't nobody gonna take care of them like like you do as a parent. And with anything like depression, anything, choices in life, what you in, what you take, what you don't take, you know, like, yeah. Just before before doing anything, talk to somebody, talk to your mom, talk to God. Most important, like, have faith. And right now, is everything I'm going through, like, that's why I'm very open. And I'm very, like, uh, positive, you know? Like, I, I stay positive regardless of what, because I have no bad heart, you know? I just make mistakes. I'm only human. And I'm learning as I go, and just to make it better, you know? Like, make every day a better choice. A message to your kids just in case, like... Yeah, I know. I'm not, not, to, not to think. No, I always think about it like that, yeah. But just in case, if, if your kids were to hear this, what do you want them to remember from it? Shit. I pretty much tell them every day, like, do good or I'll fuck you up. Even if I damn, I'm fucking come to your dreams and that. Well, not necessarily, okay, so here, I'm just going to be straight up with you. Mm -hmm. Not you passing, but Point of say something happens and you go to jail. Yeah. Your kids are going to have this tape to go back and see. Yeah. What is one message that you would want to say to your kids? That I love them. To <clears throat> forgive me for all my mistakes. To definitely never follow and be better. You know? Don't ever do drugs. Just do better choices. You know? As a parent, I would never ask my kid to do anything. Or to put them in a situation that means I don't love them and I don't love myself, you know? So, yeah, for sure. Not even if I were to ask them to do something, don't ever listen. Like, just do better. Have a better heart. Like, do better choices. Don't ever, like, fall into any addiction. Anything could be addicting now, like, to be honest. Just talk to people. Be more open. Process what you're feeling. Because when you don't process what you're feeling, or, like, grieving, depression, anything, like, you, you do stupid choices. And you don't relate that until you're in that situation. You're like, fuck, I could have, I wasn't thinking right, you know? Just you always do better choices. And now I, I make sure I tell them. So now I tell them, like, most important is finish school. Finish school is so important because a lot of kids drop out. So finish school, I tell them all the time, that's all. Like, having a high school diploma, you know, like, you can do something with yourself. It's easier to go to college, you know? Like, do, like, even tattooing now, like, there's a way to pre represent yourself. How you carry yourself is how people take you, you know? Like, I didn't raise you that way. Even though whatever I got myself into doesn't mean that you're going to go and act like that or do those choices, you know? You're going to be better and do better. I'm going to make sure you do, but you also have to want it because then if you don't want it, then you won't be, you won't get there. So it's like, I, that's that I do tell them, like, always do that, like, be positive because my, my oldest does have, like, a hard time. Thank you for listening to my story. If you guys want to ever talk or reach out for anything, depression or any questions that anybody wants to know, you can reach me at California underscore princess 91. And this is Nathan Chambers.